Thank you, Brian. Uh, I'd like to start with a collection of haiku, um, that often misunderstood form, but basically a single moment's perception, traditionally in nature, <coughs> traditionally in some way or another, evoking one of the seasons. Not all of these are, are nature haiku, however. They also are not um, in the 575s. So if you feel like counting, don't, don't try. <laughs> Anybody wants to talk to me about haiku form, I can talk to you. Anyway, between two mountains, the wings of a gliding hawk balancing sunlight. So many boulders in the stream, all of the water finding its way. She smiles at me, down Park Avenue, every light turns green. <laughs> On my mind, too, what stirs these frogs into song. January morning, drifting off with the steam from my teacup. The cloud I called her out to see, reshaped in the winter wind. Sundown, all the shadows released from their shapes. Hiking by full moon, the rocks slide a spill of light down the mountain. Kicking a white dandelion, blare of a noon siren. Winter solstice, letting the candle burn all the way down. Bitter wind, scraping the windshield to find her smiling face. After each passing car, spring peepers. Firefly on my finger lights up a space I didn't know was there. Misplaced it somehow, the book on multiple universes. This next poem is a Sestina, and uh, it's a rather elaborate poem where you have six words that have to appear in various orders as the end words in each of six stanzas. Then each, and then two of those six words occur in the last three line stanza, one internally, one at the end. Uh, this was a, a Sestina where uh, all the words were chosen completely randomly. And so the words that I drew were iris, illuminate, poignant, gargantuan, imposter, and obliterate. So you'll hear those words coming back a lot. So the poem is called Iris. And the you in this poem is a woman. And it's a, a love poem, a love story of sorts. Iris. The way that stately purple iris managed to illuminate the room at twilight was so poignant. Just the right size, nothing gargantuan like a sunflower, and not an imposter made of plastic. Just enough beauty to obliterate the blues, obliterate any unwanted mood. Not a bouquet, just one iris sent anonymously, perhaps by an imposter, a mystery person. A flower that failed at first to illuminate any memories until one, almost repressed, appeared. A gargantuan error, meeting at that big party a stranger whose poignant physical defect made you wince impolitely. Poignant because a minor defect, but close attention to it obliterated any attempt at ignoring it. His eyes, gargantuan behind super thick glasses, and one iris a different color from the other, illuminated by the track lighting, one blue, one an imposter, definitely brown, an eyeball imposter. And you laughed, which would not seem at all poignant to the tender-hearted whose kindness could illuminate the pity you should have felt, obliterate any unkind thought with the understanding that one iris need not match the other. But your gargantuan lack of manners, gargantuan insensitivity, made you feel like an imposter for a nice person. Now, this purple iris, a poignant pun, 
a gift from him, sits in your room as if to obliterate any wrongdoing, an act of forgiveness that could illuminate your darkest guilt, yet perhaps illuminate the possibility even of love, a gargantuan affair that could obliterate loneliness, real love, not that imposter lust, a poignant scenario evoked by just one purple iris. So maybe, happy illumination, because of that ocular imposter, a gargantuan triumph of love might occur. So poignant, all mistakes obliterated by a single purple iris. <laughs> Italicized, which you can't see, but um, it's the skunk speaking, it's the talking skunk. Mm -hmm. But I'll sort of indicate where those two lines occur. Skunk. Late at night, reading in bed, almost ready to turn off the light, the faint, at first, odor of skunk seeps in through the window. Perhaps the last night it can be kept open before autumn's advance into the dark. Some midnight wanderer searching for grubs, for garbage, then soon a den to curl into, an outcast oblivious to his own offense, an innocent but ready to defend his forced independence, aloneness the terrible excretion, solitary defeater of dogs but easy victim of cars and poor eyesight, never anonymous, even in death he goes on offending, I was here. I did it. I was. <laughs> uh, it's time to plant vegetable gardens, if that's what you like to do, which I do. And this is a garden poem of sorts, and it's called Radishes. As my student George told me a long time ago, if you can't grow radishes, you can't grow shit. <laughs> <laughs> I must now conclude the worst. Although other things do grow in my garden. But shit, no way. It just grows on its own, unseeded, self-cultivated, springing from nooks I never knew were arable. And then there's the shit I don't know. People have told me that, one way or another. Me, vis-a-vis, -vis, love, literature, radio tubes, poetry. Things I don't know from shine up on. Yet once I set out to be the scholar of shit, cataloging with my roommate over 100 different usages, fine-tuning distinctions between bat, horse, ape, rat, and of course, bull. No academic future at that. So here I sit on my little garden scooter to ease my knees, pushing myself backwards, and pull the weeds, finding, and pull the weeds, finding no red globes at the bottom of these plain plants that also look like weeds. Just gnarled, nematode-nibbled, shriveled pinkies. <laughs> but like many things, nourish you if you're only willing to eat some. <laughs> One of the things I like to do is climb mountains, not with ropes, not technical climbing, but things that mostly my, my legs and sometimes scrambling up over rocks and so on. But, so mountain hiking, you could say. And last summer, I uh, climbed the highest mountain in Colorado, which is called Mount Elbert. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been out west and have done any hiking out there where you better be acclimated to the, uh, to the atmosphere at that altitude. So this poem is called Elevation 14,433. The air is so thin like rain stretched out on darkened slabs of rock in the sun. I want too much of what I can't have. What little I get, slipping in and out of my lungs so quickly, no trace left behind. And all I'm trying to do is perfectly ordinary, move one foot in front of the other up this inclined, rocky plain of a massive mountain on a bright, clear morning, sun at my back, <coughs> gibbous moon overhead, climbing into my shadow, just below what appears to be the summit, but certainly isn't, mirage perpetually beyond reach. I'd give anything for more oxygen when moving 50 feet along a switchback, nothing too steep, draws every molecule out of my lungs, 
gasping, stalled, strength in my calves and thighs, strength, excuse me, strength in my calves and thighs gone until I can pump richer blood. Yet somehow keep going up into brighter thinness when finally I can stand still in the sun, surrounded by nothing but thin air, no rocks to block my view of anything, closer than I've ever climbed to that margin where nothing's to breathe at all on this tiny sphere, infinite thinness of empty space looming over my head. called lost. I get lost in my syntax, lost in my shirt, lost in my erratic jazz solos whistling down the road, my dog on a leash, who goes missing from time to time, lost to us at least. Lost to my parents who never could keep track of me, though I never went far. Lost in relationships for sure, carrying long strings of them wherever I go. I could turn around and follow one back to a place that doesn't exist anymore. Lost in time, lost in space, lost inside my devious head, lost between my brain and the tip of my tongue, lost in this poem, wherever did I think it would go? Lost to my better judgment, may it find me before I head off into nonsense, too many forks in the road, lost to all who would find me. If they just knew where to look, I'd be there. Thank you.